on this edition of City Talk, meet hardworking city employees Richard Lynn, Laura Dragowski, and Maurice Matthews. City Talk starts right now. City Talk, where we attempt to answer the musical question, what do these people do around here all day? Uh, oddly enough, in a shocking expose, we continue to reveal many, if not most, if not all of them actually work. Uh, say hello to the chief of River Rescue Operations, Richard Lynn. Richard, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, John. Um, so that sounds like an awesome responsibility. Tell us what River Rescue is in general in the first place. Well, River Rescue was born in 1986 as a result of putting the uh, fire, or excuse me, the, the police patrol River Patrol, along with the EMS dive team. It's been together ever since, you know, combining the efforts of police officers and paramedics who are divers uh, together to help uh, people out on the water with any sort of emergency. So did you get a lot more action during the holidays when the, the rivers are just loaded? Well, uh, of course, during the summertime, uh, we're going to be more, much more busy. Uh, we have the second uh, most registered boats uh, in the country per capita. Oh, no kidding. I had no idea. Um, how did you get uh, this job yourself? I started off with the city EMS uh, back in 1989, uh, progressed uh, to become a crew chief, and then uh, was interested in uh, the water aspect, uh, the water rescue aspect, and uh, took my test, uh, passed it, and then uh, went through the uh, over 900 hours of training that it become it takes to become a, a river rescue diver. Uh, so have you had to indeed dive in and uh, save some folks uh, over your time? I personally have not. Uh, we have many of our divers who have. Uh, I was only on the unit for a couple years before I got promoted to district chief, uh, after which I was then put in charge of the unit. Uh, you must get questions occasionally about the 80s motion picture striking distance with Sarah Jessica Parker and Bruce Willis. We do. In fact, uh, soon after that movie, uh, came out uh, we had uh, people asking us where Bruce Willis was. We all, our, our pat answer was it was his day off. I see. He's had a lot of days off. Yes, he has. Now, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's fascinating work. How, uh, how many folks get in trouble per uh, spring and summer season? I, I'm sure it varies, and you hope it's less every year. But That's correct. I mean, we do what, what we can to help promote safety out on the water, uh, to help prevent uh, anybody from getting hurt or injured. Uh, but that's not our only mission. Uh, we do help uh, stranded boaters. We help uh, with uh, evidence recovery for the police departments in the area, as well as enforce the laws on, on the water. Uh, okay, and is there a, a trend? Is, are more people in need of your assistance or fewer or just leveled off? I think it's, it's pretty much level, uh, but like I said, we, we're, we're doing our best to, to lower those numbers. Uh, wearing PFDs is, is a, a big fight of ours. We encourage people of all ages to wear them. What uh, no are those again? Personal flotation devices. Okay, that's right. Life assume, vests. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, they, they, they save lives. They really do. So people in this day and age are still reluctant in some cases to wear them. Absolutely. Just like you have uh, people out on their bicycles reluctant to wear a helmet, even though it's been proven how, uh, time and time again that they, they do save lives, we have the same problem with the personal flotation devices. Put on your life jacket. Simple I, message. Are, they're, they're not really that heavy either. I mean, it's not like you can't move around and do what you want to do with them on. No, in the olden days, it, it used to be you know, there was the one size fits all type deal, but now they make them more uh, comfortable as, and easier to move around in. Um, so, uh, what would your advice be regarding safety other than wear your life jacket? Well, there, there's a, there's a three tiered approach to, to safety out on the water whenever you're out on the water. One is know the water. Know where the, the problems could be in the water. If you don't know, ask somebody. The boating community is a bunch of friendly people and they'll be more than happy to talk to you and explain to, and show you where the dangers may be. Number two is file a float plan. A plan where somebody other than whoever's on the boat knows where you plan on being on the water. That way if for some unknown reason that you don't check in uh, we can know where to start looking for you. And number three is wear your PFD. Be safe. That's, that's the key. So where might trouble spots lie? 
You mentioned know where the trouble is, you know. Like. Right, well, each, each body of water has its own problem areas, uh, places where there's inlets or uh, where the current runs faster or where there's debris just below the surface of the water that may cause a problem for your boat. Uh, how do you let people know where they are? Well, as you said, they should just ask. Are there maps which show? Well, there, there, you can, uh, the U.S. Corps of Engineers does have maps uh, that show you um, somewhat where some of the dangers are, but they change every day because of uh, water and, and the debris that moves through the water. Uh, Richard Lynn from River Rescue, do you, you seem like you like this job. Oh, I love this job. Uh, I've been uh, doing public safety since I was uh, 14 years old when I was a junior firefighter in Monroeville. Uh, I've loved serving people ever since, and uh, I really do enjoy it. So, in generally speaking, in terms of public safety, are we learning our lessons as uh, grown-ups, or are we just getting horribly out of control in the opposite direction? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it's funny. Uh, some people say that we're getting better, and some not so much. Uh, it's really tough to pinpoint any one thing. You know, a lot of it is the, the resources that you have available to you and uh, how you utilize those. Richard Lynn, thank you so much for doing City Talk today. Thanks, John. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with another fascinating city employee. Stay with us. If you love them enough to relearn math so you can teach them math, then surely you'll check NHTSA.gov slash the right seat to make sure they're correctly buckled in the back seat. Welcome back to City Talk. Say hello to Laura Dragowski from the mayor's office, the Office of Equity, which could have far-reaching implications beyond the universe. What is the Office of Equity? And uh, tell us what you do. So uh, I am the Critical Communities Initiatives Manager in the newly formed Office of Equity. Uh, my role in the office is to ensure that the voices of individuals who uh, may have less opportunity to self-advocate, who are often not thought of to be at the table, but are frequently deeply affected by the decisions that we're making, uh, is to ensure that those voices are heard, that we are focusing on those needs, that we're not leaving people behind as we um, move forward as one Pittsburgh. Uh, very much in the vision of the mayor, we want to ensure that uh, people who use drugs, people who are experiencing homelessness, people who are dealing with um, uh, untreated mental illness, that those individuals are, are all part of our community and that we're accommodating their needs. And two of the things you spent a lot of time on are what you just mentioned, homelessness and the opioid crisis. Absolutely. Uh, opioid crisis, so impossible to uh, tackle and have complete success with, obviously. If we all know the statistics. How do you go about trying to combat that? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's overwhelming, right? And um, we in the city uh, have had the um, first line of response that we offer is our fire, police, and EMS, and they've uh, done really a heroic job in uh, working to prevent overdose. So when you hear the term overdose, oftentimes you think that person has died. In reality, an overdose is just the experience that a person has, if, it's, if we're talking about an opioid, where their respiratory um, system starts to shut down. So we have a chance to reverse that overdose. And that's a great thing, and that's what uh, our first responders have do been doing. So uh, in 2016, the Public Safety Department, Director Hisrick, uh, uh, asked that all first responders carry Narcan. Narcan, if you're not familiar, is a um, antidote to opioids, and it's extremely effective. It's been in use for decades. Um, it's taken some time for it to be made available to the lay public, but all of our first responders do carry it, and all first responder bureaus respond in the event of an overdose. So whoever can get there first would get there, and that was a really great leadership that we saw from our public safety department, fire police, and EMS to do that. So one of our, our great lines of, of response is our first responders but then after we've reversed that over overdose it's important to recognize that the the that person continues to live in a situation that may be unsafe so how do you help them beyond uh, 
giving them the Narcan and hopefully saving their lives or preserving their lives. Right, right. It's not, it's not easy. I guess if it were easy, I, I'd be out of a job, which wouldn't be the <laughs> worst thing. Uh, so part of it is the stigma that society may um, uh, impose on individuals, right? It's calling folks addicts and junkies. It's thinking of a person as being defined by their use uh, and not recognizing that this is a, a person who may be struggling with something, maybe not be as healthy as we want them to be. So it's treating people like people, and that sounds really... Um, simple and it is it's just looking beyond uh, the immediate judgments that we might make about people and that includes every person who works in city government and frankly every person in the city can do that more can treat a person like a person um, uh, so we talk a lot about stigma reduction we've been working in partnership with the health department to ensure that we're training everybody uh, who's willing to um, learn how to reverse an opioid overdose so you see I have my I carry Narcan button, uh, and we've been trying to get that out into the community, and it starts conversations. So it sounds simple, right? We get someone to train to use Narcan, but then they don't think of this as an unapproachable, frightening um, experience. They think of it as a way to help. It's just the way we learn to do uh, bystander CPR. Um, so we can all be members of the community that's helping people to be safer. Um, in uh, my past, I've worked with uh, the syringe exchange program in the city of Pittsburgh. So Allegheny County and Philadelphia are the two regions in the state that allow syringe exchange. Um, we have a, a syringe exchange program that was founded in the mid-90s and has been operating in the city since. And the role of a syringe exchange program is to provide people with sterile supplies so that they're less likely to get a bloodborne infection. But the unintended or maybe intended consequence of that is that they have individuals that they can see on a weekly basis with whom they uh, can confide and in whom they can trust. So if, uh, if I'm seeing you, John, at the syringe exchange every week and one day you come in and you've decided that you'd like some different help, you'd like to get on a methadone or suboxone program, you'd like to go to an abstinence-based treatment program, you know you can trust me with that question. You can come in and ask. Uh, so our needle exchange program in this region is called Prevention Point, and in 2017 they had about a 30% treatment referral rate. I hear you. You sound like uh, that you like your job. You seem like an actual dedicated public servant. I think we all are dedicated public servants. I do but love. I love my. Do you job. think anybody knows that? You know, it's hard. <laughs> I um, I mean, I didn't always work in the government. So prior to working here, I uh, worked for a company that was jointly owned by UPMC and GE, um, and I've grown up. Uh, outside of Pittsburgh. So I, I know now as a government employee, people always say, but I live in Pittsburgh. And then, you know, the the uh, address is outside the city limits. So I won't make the mistake of saying I grew up in Pittsburgh. I grew up about 15 minutes north. My mother uh, my mother was a Pittsburgh public school teacher. Uh, and um, uh, I didn't have the privilege of working in, t in city government until 2017. And prior to that, I think it's very easy, again, it's the empathy thing, to make assumptions to say, if my street get didn't get paved, these people don't care about me. Um, if if uh, if the mayor won't show up to my event, he doesn't care. Uh, and being on the other side, you realize that we have um, city government officials and, and employees who work tirelessly, uh, who would, um, I think, in the private sector be very competitive for jobs, but they choose to be here because this is what they want to be doing. Uh, I certainly see that in the Office of Equity and with my colleagues. There's an incredibly deep passion to address inequities in our community to make sure that we're um, we're not making assumptions that we're including the individuals uh, who will be affected by change in the decisions to make change um, to allow those voices to drive us uh, as opposed to just making assumptions which is usually the faster thing to do but it's not necessarily the durably um, uh, healthy and equitable thing to do so yes I think I have had the privilege of encountering a large number of very dedicated public servants. Um, work a lot with the downtown uh, public safety folks, our police officers in the substation, particularly officers Wisner and, and Kimbrough. Uh, I work a lot with the Zone 1 uh, uh, commander, Commander Ragland, to look at how we can bridge the gap between um, inequities in the way that we might be interacting with um, uh, individuals in our communities and to ensure that we really are uh, dedicated to the health and the outcomes of our community members, positive outcomes. Laura Dragowski.
Thank you so much for yeah. doing this program. And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this because you? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an opportunity after we talk to learn how to uh, use Narcan as this well. This is so awesome. Here so you I get go. a free lesson as here's well. Your, Thank here's you so your here's your iCarry Narcan button, and if you would like to get an iCarry Narcan button or anything else, you can reach out to me in the mayor's office, and I will make that available. We have stickers, and if you'd like to get Narcan, you can get it uh, in the pharmacy. It's legal to get. We can also connect you with the Allegheny County Health Department so that you can have some Narcan and save some lives. Thanks. Free stuff. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so uh, much. Stay with us. Meet another employee. Won't you? You will. Stay with us. I'm Ernest Rajakun with the Office of Community Affairs, and I have an important announcement. Snow Angels is a program that helps minimize the hardships of winter by pairing volunteers with elderly or disabled residents to assist with snow removal. If you need help or want to volunteer, call 311 or visit pittsburghpa.gov slash snowangels. Thank you. Welcome back to City Talk. Say hello to Maurice Matthews of the City's Office of Special Events. Maurice, welcome to the program. Hey, how's it going? Okay, man. How's it going with you? I'm doing fantastic. You look fantastic. I try. Uh, now, these special events, uh, everybody in the city of Pittsburgh and the surrounding communities know that there's boatloads of them. But give us an idea of a few of them that you work on just so people will know what you're doing day to day. Uh, we just wrapped up the Greenfield Glide. Uh, we have the Riverview 5K coming up. And when it's the Heritage Day, it's like the day after. Lots of races. Lots of races. Um, and we have um, the Bach Beethoven and Brunch, which is on Sunday mornings. That's once uh, a week in Squirrel Hill. Yep. And then uh, farmers markets throughout all of town. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. I mean, like the city puts on like so many things. Like, they really I could do. Sit here, I could sit here and go on like for hours about I'm what sure, we do. I'm sure you could. <laughs> And there's only eight of you in the Office of Special Events. Yes. Seems like there should be like 50 or something. It should be, but you know what? It, <laughs> no. hey, it's called job security. Yeah, we're a lean, mean fighting machine. That's anyway, right. right. Serving the taxpayers. Um, so, for example, you and I have worked together on Bach, Beethoven, and Brunch. You're doing a lot more work than me who just kind of shows up. Yes. But uh, you have tents to set up. You have stages to set up. The, the, it can take hours to set up all this equipment and tables and chairs, et cetera, correct? Yeah, it, it could take hours, but... Uh, like the week before, I'll get together with via email and talk to the band, see how many chairs they need on the stage, what they need audio-wise, and then I just come to come together with my team and we kind of just kind of break down what we need to be, um, you know, how to make things run efficiently, like a, an efficient machine. That's basically what our office is. So you're, you're like a rapid deployment force. Hey, yeah. <laughs> to set up the stuff like quickly, even though it's uh, on a massive scale. Uh, how did you get into this job? Um, Honestly, I was just on the city's website one day, just going through looking for jobs. Uh, I moved up here from Washington, D.C., um, and then I was, like, working odd jobs around town, kind of just going on the Internet, went on the city's website and saw this. I was like, you know, special event planning. Uh, you know, I kind of had that experience in college, you know, when you want to throw, like, a little house party or something. you got to make sure everything's good logistically-wise. So I was like, it seems like a good fit, and I'm also a people's person, so I was like, I'd be out and about in the city and. That's how I came across it. So you came in and sold them on the fact that you were a good house party planner, and they're like, we got to have this guy for special events. <laughs> uh, that was part of it. Okay. And then, yeah, but, it, you know, it was a good bit of that side. Like, hey, you know, I know how to make, you know, things run well. Uh, have there been any disasters? Uh, I don't know, a lightning storm or, you know. Um, I wouldn't say, not, I wouldn't say like a disaster, but, you know, things haven't gone according to plan. But, you know, we kind of just work together and make that um Go, go well, mm -hmm, go better mm -hmm. than what you would think of do. But, uh, I mean, unfortunately, no disasters. You know, we, we try not no, to. No, I'm glad. That yeah. Disasters are bad. I'm so glad yeah. to hear that there aren't any disasters. Yeah. But you're basically saying, like, if it just starts raining or if it's excessively hot. Of ex excessively, excessively hot, I know I hydrate, you know, myself. And uh, we always have, like, water on, on hand with our staff. Uh, lightning, we kind of, like, check our phones to make sure, that, you know, severe thunderstorm warnings or watches, if that's. That's coming up in the area, and we have to like shut everything down, especially on our movie nights, you mm -hmm. know, because we've got this big screen, you got people sitting out in open fields. That's a very popular one, though, isn't it? Movie yes. nights? Yes, yes, yes. I think the my personally, I think the best one is uh, the one Wednesday nights at uh, Chinley, um, the Hill. I forget the the, the name of Flagstaff Hill. There we okay. go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, why? Because it's just such a picturesque location, or yeah, exactly. Okay. Like you see, like the skyline of the city. It's just a giant hill, and it's almost like a natural amphitheater because of the sound. Just you know, ricochets like off the hill, and you can you can hear it from like probably on the other side of town because the giant speakers we use. Are people uh, pretty blown away by that particular event? I mean, in other words, a lot of positive feedback. A lot of positive feedback. I haven't heard anything bad about it. 
And I went to one of those a movie night on the north side too. And I know you have jazz uh, events also on the north yes, side. Yes, we have. But we you have, have them jazz. all over the city. We have all over the city. Yeah. So no matter what neighborhood you live in, you can find somewhere walking distance to go to, or maybe even biking. Uh, sounds like you like this job. I love it. What's so What's so so great about it? Um, we're gonna say one is you know it's kind of like you do your own thing. You kind of um, you get an event and you make it run well, and then we opt. Our input matters. Like Brian loves to listen to Brian, what your we boss, have. Brian yeah, Cates. Brian Cates. He loves to hear what we have to say, and you know to kind of make things you know new. You don't want to always have something like the same. You want to change it up a little bit, and he welcomes that. And which I love. It. I've never ever had a job like that. Or even my friends don't even have jobs where their input matters. So, interesting. Yeah, uh, that was seriously is interesting. Um, so, did you just luck out to get a good uh, manager? Or is that? I, I mean, I, I guess that's that's how okay. it goes. Yeah, okay. I just got. Yeah, maybe I should go like buy a scratch off or something because I really didn't think <laughs> about that till now. <laughs> uh, you plan on continuing in this line of work for the foreseeable future? Yes, yes, I do. Yep. And would you like to, you know, stage a coup and eventually be the big guy in the department? Oh, uh, I mean, only well, when the big guy moves on. I was going to say, yeah, I can't, yeah. yeah, I can't just, you know, push the big guy out the way. But you know, I mean, it's it's event planning. You know, it, it's the skills are transferable. Yeah, they, they can yeah. go like anywhere. You could do anything. Yes, exactly. After this, yeah. yeah. So it doesn't mean like I have to be the next in line up. It can you can do like a lap move over, over and up. Absolutely. Yep. Or start your own event planning thing or whatever. Hey, I, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that took a lot, but <laughs> yeah, 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 not easy, but yeah, you, you probably have the skills. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, are you surprised? Did you think maybe the job would be easier than it was? Uh, because some people tend to think that city workers are not killing themselves. Um, I, I thought maybe a little easier, but uh, I've always, my, when growing up, my mom told me that anything that comes easy is not worth it. Hmm. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's right at that level where it keeps me, you know, focused and not like lackadaisical. Awesome. Maurice Matthew, thanks so much Thank for you. doing it. Appreciate it's really that. good to meet at some dedicated public service. Who knew? <laughs> uh, that's City Talk. Uh, we'll see you next time.